Uh, thank you, everyone uh, in the room and online um, for joining uh, another uh, iteration of the uh, language circle. Um, and today it's my uh, immense pleasure, I would say, to to uh, to welcome Ayelet Landau to uh, to the language circle. Before I introduce uh, you, I need to announce a couple of things. Uh, the first one is uh, for the people online. You are unfortunately not allowed to unmute yourself and just start talking. Now, why is that? That's because we had an occasion of Zoom trolling in the language circle, and that was very not nice. And so we decided to to uh, block uh, the ability of you know just starting to speak, sharing your screen, all that. It's impossible for the uh, online participants. Um, so if you want to participate in the discussion, if you have a question, if you want to just speak up, then please. Give us a sign, raise a hand, uh, type your question in the chat, and then we can easily just um, uh, give you the microphone and 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 let you talk. Yeah, it's just a safety measure these days. Unfortunately, we have to we have to live with such uh, measures time and again. Uh, second thing that I need to announce is that uh, we are all being recorded. Now, uh, there's a camera in the room, and there's also, of course, the online participants if they share their video um, and all of that is, is being recorded because at some point we want to put those language circle talks on on uh, youtube um, as a little um, library of uh, of uh, interesting presentations um, so if you don't want that to happen then please just uh, shut down your your camera as most people already did and then it should be fine for the people in the room if you don't want to be on the internet then just move outside the scope of the camera in case that's Possible. I don't know. Probably there's a corner somewhere where you can just hide. Uh, okay, and the third thing that I wanted to announce is that we're meeting tonight at 6.30 p.m. at Niko Sushi. Did I say that correctly? Niko Sushi uh, in the city center. Um, let us know if you want to join because then Carbo needs to extend the table that we booked. It's apparently like a small place. So, um, okay. Anything else that I need to announce? No, all right. Excellent. Ayelet Landau, thanks for making it to, to Leipzig. Uh, Ayelet is an associate professor in the departments of cognitive sciences and psychology at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Now, what is she doing in Berlin? She's doing a sabbatical. Thank you for telling me because I didn't know about that. I thought you'd actually move there, and, which would be great, I mean, to have you in, in Berlin. But maybe, you know, it will it will happen at some point. Maybe you like the city so much and you, know, you never know. Yeah. So, um um, you studied psychology, philosophy, philosophy, and neurophysiology in Jerusalem, received your PhD in cognition, brain, behavior from UC Berkeley, and afterwards you moved to the uh, Ernst Strengmann Institute in Frankfurt am Main, uh, working with Pascal Fries, right? Okay, excellent. Um, for her postdoc, um, the research of her lab is about, well, perception, attention, temporal processing, and the cognitive function of neural oscillations, and that's, of course, one reason for for uh, inviting you to the language circle. For me, um, maybe even the stronger reason was that you have also work where you're bridging your system's neuroscientific perspective and all the uh, all the experience and knowledge that you have in that in that uh, well field, and you kind of project it onto onto language. And I think that's extremely important that we have uh, 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 people. Um, that we, the neurobiology of language, has uh, has that stimulation from the outside um, to like change our perspectives and change also our, the way that we uh, think about speech and language. Yeah, and so for me, you are really a person who sits also at that intersection, and it's, I think incredibly uh, important uh, to build those bridges. So, um, thank you very much for coming here, and we are looking uh, forward to your presentation. Floor is you. Yeah, so um, thanks, Lars, for the invitation and for the um, kind introduction. It's very special to be here today. Um, I look forward to also chatting with some of you later today. Um, I'm not seeing my presenter notes here. Do you think I could just freely attempt to get that without something Sorry. radical happening? I think I managed. Okay, very good. <laughs> 
Right. So I'm in the business of understanding this very complex organ, as many of you are as well. And essentially, the project um, goes down to understanding how mental processes are explained with neural mechanisms. And today, I decided to talk about most of the work I've done on attention and ask about the temporal domain of um, attention as it unfolds in time. But what I would like to keep in mind, a little bit in line with what Lars has uh, said, is that this is basically one corner um, of the work that we do in the lab, um, which basically attempts to take temporal structure in brain and cognition and investigate many different facets. And I really was debating what I should talk to you about today. Should I talk about what I would argue is my bread and butter, or would I talk uh, to you about the things that kind of, I suppose, help me enter into your radar? I opted for giving my bread and butter because I think that's the, the, the parallel symposia that you probably will not attend at the conference. And so this is my chance to tell you where I come from. Um, but at the end of the talk, uh, after we will discuss um, attention as it unfolds over time, um, I hope to keep a little bit of time to tell you a little bit about um, our work on uh, time, perception, temporal cognition as a whole, which is a large project going on in the lab. Um, I will also allude to the work uh, spearheaded by Maya Inbao, who really is the person that showed me how to make that kind of bridge, um, as well as other work uh, we do on uh, other rhythms we have in the body, motor tempo, uh, which is considered a trait, work we've already uh, uh, published and um, have some extra new exciting work on that as well, as well as looking at ways in which temporal structure might be able to enhance or um, facilitate sustained performance. So this is kind of a one slide that tells the story of the lab, and um, I will briefly touch upon everything at the end. But as I said, I would like to start with how does attention unfold in time. And I know I'm taking a bunch of research uh, 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 language researchers, um, the language circle into a domain that maybe they uh, less uh, uh, visit. So um, so uh, I hope it will be a worthwhile ride for you. And I think that it will also show you that um, maybe there are uh, general domain, uh, de domain general principles that we could glean and think about from a slightly different standpoint. So I would like to tell you a little bit about attentional sampling, which is, uh, I would argue, an organizing principle in our uh, perceptual systems. And my talk will take us through uh, three uh, studies, three bodies of works, or three questions that uh, are related to uh, vision, and a, a fourth, which actually goes beyond the visual system. So I might have you back online there. <laughs> uh, but essentially, when I'm talking about attention, I would like to just bring the everyday example, which has been a part of my daily life here in Germany, which is, you know, faced with this very, very rich environment, right? We're facing difficult choices every day. Now, if you knew me, you would know this is not a difficult choice. There's a clear right answer here. My heart goes to the loud and poisson, that item that really, uh, you know, is very difficult to obtain anywhere else outside Germany. Um, and so this is kind of my, uh, the type of attention that I am talking about. You have your attention to one thing that advances your goals. But, you know, as we've shown before, at first glance, there is competition to this scenario. So attention really entails both a competitive element, which is then resolved with a selection process. When we look at um, older papers from the uh, systems neuroscience, um, going back to the 90s, the seminal work on um, bias competition theory, um, we could kind of give the physiological description of this story uh, by looking at recordings from V2. Um, and in this case, what you're seeing here would be um, a fixation point with uh, um, the dashed line here representing the receptive field. And in the screen right now, what you're seeing is basically two stimuli. One stimuli the receptive field cares about, and then the other stimulus, which the receptive field really doesn't care much about. So this uh, vertical line is what this neuron responds to, and then uh, we would say this is the non-preferred stimulus in the receptive field because the response is much uh, lower. Now, interestingly, when we put both stimuli in the receptive field, rather than have some kind of winner take all or some summation of all the responses, what we typically see is this kind of reality where a response seems to be falling right in between. 
So we look at this and we read into this, or the researchers who did the seminal work uh, would argue this is a reflection of a competitive interaction, perhaps on lateral inhibition or inhibitory dynamics that results in this uh, lesser response. What uh, can attention do for us in this situation? Well, I will now superimpose the case in which an animal is now having their attention directed to the vertical stimulus. And essentially by directing attention alone, the response is regained to a degree where, uh, whereby the, uh, the response is as if it were in isolation. So it resolves the competitive interaction. For the uh, sake of this talk, I would like to kind of um, draw this dynamic onto a visual hierarchy. So we're back to bakery and in our visual hierarchy, which is simplified, we have a lower visual area and we have higher visual areas. And from what I've shown you, Essentially, in lower visual areas, we have very small receptive fields, so there is not much competition. So in a lower visual area, what we would typically see is both the Kaiser portion and the Lagen poisson. Everything is good. Everything is receiving a neuronal representation. However, it is the higher visual areas whereby we're now in that competitive scenario. And as the gray spotlight uh, insinuates, this participant is paying attention to the Lagen Croissant, and therefore the higher visual area with the larger receptive fields uh, will enjoy kind of the representation of the uh, Lagen Croissant, although the Kaiser portion is in the receptive field. Okay. Now, um, uh, the first part of the talk, I would like to talk about focused attention, that exact scenario, and show you how focused attention itself is temporally structured. So what do I mean and how do I examine it? What I mean is you're experiencing the Laogon Croissant continuously. However, if we were to probe your performance or your perception very finely in time, we might uh, find that this representation is actually not continuous. There is temporal structure there. And the temporal structure that we were able to describe is consistent with it being sampled eight times a second. And I'm just kind of putting the, uh, the, um, the references to the works that we have uh, done to show this. I will walk you through one of our studies, but we have actually shown this in a number of studies by now. Um, so in a most recent study, uh, we had a uh, a grating in the center of uh, the screen um, and people were fixating, their eye position was uh, monitored. And at a given moment in time, we have this reset event, these five dots that are flashing, um, after which a target appears, which is what the, the participant is doing. The participant is having to report the appearance of a very brief 25 millisecond decrement in contrast that will appear at some point, okay? Let's take a look at the ongoing time uh, profile of this uh, trial structure. So we have the grating, it's up there for a long time, almost three seconds, two and a half seconds or so. Um, at some point we have this flash and that flash is actually a really important moment. It is hypothesized to kind of reset whatever processes are going on. So here I'm gonna connect again to the theme of neural oscillations. If there is some kind of temporal structure, um, this is gonna be a moment which we think is gonna be kind of whatever process is going on, it will be uh, reset. And then we actually probe your ability to perform on that decrement uh, finally in time. So now I'm just showing the target event here in the um, purple uh, rectangle with just one example, but all these gray little lines are possible time points where a target could appear um, after the reset. So we basically exhaustively sample time for your performance. And what we find when we do that is that uh, now I'm plotting on the uh, x-axis time, on the y-axis your accuracy to perform, and I'm just mentioning that the zero point is when the reset occurs, and these are the times we actually present targets at. Um, and so this is just uh, uh, the data from a sample, uh, which actually by now is published, um, with that exact scenario. Um, actually, this is one of the nicer examples uh, um, uh, of this dynamic because you could actually see this dynamic with your bare eyes. There is some kind of increase, decrease, increase, decrease. There is a fluctuation in performance. We could describe these type of data uh, using spectral decomposition. And when we do that, we find that um, there is temporal structure that is consistent with uh, a peak in the spectrum around eight hertz. 
So, um, so remember our hierarchy, uh, remember our higher uh, order visual area. And as you can see, um, I need to modify it now and say basically within this higher visual area, even in the case of uh, focused attention, uh, what we can see is that a representation seems to be fluctuating over time. I managed to describe that by flashing, resetting a process and then measuring it, but that is kind of the process that is being inferred. Um, in the next uh, study, I would like to talk about an interesting other scenario. Some of us walk around with um, slightly more flexible alliances to our pastries, right? So some of us might actually care equally about the Kaiser fortune and about the Laudan Croissant. So what happens then? And how would we describe how this competitive interaction gets resolved over time in uh, a higher visual area, which has a receptive field, which could actually include both pastries. And now I'm going uh, down memory lane to uh, actually the first uh, paper I published with Pascal Fries uh, during my postdoc, 2012. Um, and, um, and there, what we did actually looked very similar to what I just showed you. Um, here, the two locations that are relevant are placed on either uh, visual field and people are fixating at uh, the center, at a given moment, there is a flash. And the flash, as you know, resets the process here, not only in time, but also in space. So I know that an onset will capture attention. And after that, I can present, at some point, uh, the contrast decrement, much like the previous study I've shown. This is the overview over time. So here we were feeling very generous with time. Trials lasted almost four seconds. The reset is the moment uh, we're very much interested in. And then we will probe uh, performance at that location uh, in many uh, different time bands. Um, and in addition to having the same location probe for performance, we will also have the opposite location probe for performance. When we do that, and again, I'm plotting uh, the x-axis is time as a function of the reset and the y-axis would be accuracy, how accurate people were in detecting this very brief, very faint target. I didn't say this before, but the targets are actually customized so that they are difficult and performance is kind of um, around, uh, is not very high. So it's a very difficult target. And what you can see is a time course where uh, most prominently what you're noticing is that there is some kind of masking around the presentation of the four dots, okay? Now, this is not what we set out to study. And in fact, many people have shown this masking effect. It's called object substitution masking. Uh, but it definitely makes a point that this four dots really did reset performance. We thought it would give us an advantage, but in fact, it made people blind at that location, right? So, right, if the... If the target appeared and right after it, uh, these four dots appeared, people were practically not seeing it. When we look at what happens later, we see that there is this kind of fluctuation in performance when we look at performance in the same location. And um, when we superimpose the opposite location, we see a similar dynamic. Again, there is some kind of ebbing and flowing in performance as a function of time. Um, as you might notice, these fluctuations seem to be in, um, in kind of an anti-correlated when you look at them in time. Um, but we could take this whole dynamic and delineate it in the spectral domain where we see that we have, um, we have a fluctuation at each location that is consistent with uh, four hertz uh, 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 peak in the spectrum. And, um, and of course, we could also look at the phase relationships, which are non-uniformly dis distributed um, around and are in antiphase. So, um, so that is kind of what we have there. Uh, so the point I would like to make in this part of the talk is that the ongoing processing of a given stimulus, single stimulus fluctuates at around uh, eight hertz or eight times a second when we, um, when we have to distribute attention over two different locations, it seems to be the case that this frequency now is divided over the two locations and ends up being temporally structured in the switching rate such that each location is sampled four times a second. Now, sampling um, um, in these frequencies is something that we know uh, occurs in the literature. Um, might also resonate with some of the frequencies that you're interested in. But when we look at systems neuroscience, uh, we know that we have um, 
animals that are whisking, that are uh, moving, their, uh, that are licking, that are sniffing at these, uh, at these frequencies. Uh, primates, both human and non-human, uh, seem to move their eyes in a way that is consistent with um, these type of frequencies. So as an attention researcher, uh, walking into the arena and thinking about attention as kind of a sensory end of some exploration mechanism uh, is quite interesting and quite natural. And one could just raise the question of, you know, what is, um, what causes what? I think in the field, we've often had, you know, the motor people saying the motor exploration impacts the sensation, and that's why you will see in sensation uh, such kind of temporal structure. Um, and I think you also have a, a counter camp that would say, you know, sense, senses operate with this neural oscillation, and that is when the motor exploration actually is timed. Um, I think probably everyone's correct in that sense, and we're probably looking at some kind of sensory motor loop consistent with active sensing. And actually, these are things that uh, we're exploring in the lab um, on better days uh, right now. So really describing the system, both for its motor exploration behaviors, as well as for the sensory um, elements and consequences of those. That, of course, also um, requires um, kind of a, a move towards more ecological uh, type of science, which is also something that we're uh, trying to develop right now. And if anyone wants to talk about it uh, later, I'm very happy to do so. Now, um, I'll just very briefly say that um, after um, we've initially published this work um, in 2012, uh, there was quite a number of other groups that have uh, looked into different forms of extensions and some replications of the finding. Um, in uh, many different domains, in action, in object-based attention, um, even in different uh, sensory modalities. Um, but common to all of these studies uh, was this logic that we used in our study, which is namely this underlying model that we've had. I've described it verbally and now in a figure. So the model that we've had was there is a reset and the reset is kind of um, biasing or organizing system such that we will be able to then measure it afterwards okay so the underlying model which is not measured in the studies behavioral studies at least uh really assumes that leading up was this dynamic except hey i couldn't probe it and the, re the this reset really allows me to do that um but of course um the question really is can we track this dynamic to confirm that this is indeed the model, or maybe our reset is basically like, you know, throwing a stone into a pond that is otherwise completely flat and we're perturbing it. And then it's recovering from this perturbation with this temporal structure. So in order to actually look here, so to speak, and I apologize to the Zoom uh, members that you don't see my person or my uh, mouse pointer, uh, in order to look at what happens before the reset, we turn to a known response we can measure in physiology in these type of experiments, uh, which is this, uh, this is just an example subject. So if I show a subject a very strong uh, visual stimulus, I can actually uh, show evidence for the, uh, the degree of processing, if you will, uh, of the grating using non-invasive physiology. In this case, this is MEG. In this case, these are MEG. Uh, data that were projected into source space to hone in on the gamma band response, so the narrow band gamma band uh, response around 50 hertz for this particular subject. Um, so if I just look at this uh, section here uh, and plot the spectrum, then this is what it looks like. And of course, pivotal to assigning this response to the processing is uh, is the fact that it is narrow band. I will say that part of the perks of being in the Anschulman Institute was to kind of be housed with researchers that are actually measuring these type of responses invasively. And knowing that although I'm doing non-invasive physiology and although my specificity in terms of the sources is really not very precise, the temporal and spectral morphology really matches those responses. So it gives us some kind of confidence. Now, what did we do? So what I actually wanted to ask, and this is now um, a few years later, is can I actually track fluctuations in the quality of processing that would be consistent with temporal structure that we see in behavior? And so what we did is we took advantage of the fact that we have two hemispheres representing contralateral sides of the visual 
of the visual field. And um, in each of those, we can take an ongoing brain signature and ask, do we see some temporal structure or do we see some alternation in biasing of the processing as a function of time? Now, if you will note, the measurement of a response to two visual fields is always there, right? I don't need to do any reset event if I have um, a bias in one moment, I should be able to look at the other hemisphere and see, uh, so to speak, a disadvantaged uh, uh, processing uh, going on. And I won't go into great detail on the um, analysis here, but I will just say that what we did is we focused on the pre-target brain dynamics. We don't have the four dots, so we're not throwing stones into anyone's pond. Um, we're just looking at the target and asking what led to that target. And we're also yoking that analysis to whether that target was detected or whether that target was missed, assuming that preferred uh, biasing towards that target would result in a successful uh, detection uh, compared to disadvantaged processing. And this is quite underspecified, uh, but that's because I want to tell you about more stuff and newer stuff, but I'm very happy to go into the details. I will just say that we do find a significant phase locking between hit and miss trials in the four hertz gamma fluctuation. So we're basically looking at this ongoing gamma response and we're looking at whether one hemisphere is biased versus the other at uh, the envelope, say to, so to speak, the four hertz envelope of, uh, of this response. And we find this particular source, um, I'm, and admittedly this is non-invasive physiology, but I will say this source is also kind of consistent with the source that we see for the gamma band response to begin with. Um, and I guess maybe more, uh, okay, two important details here. I guess um, one important detail is to say the four hertz gamma phase actually accounts for about 60% performance modulation. So if I compare the best phase to the worst phase, that uh, adds up to a 16% modulation, something we're used to seeing in attention uh, literature. And um, I guess I don't have it on this slide, but this, uh, uh, this cluster that I'm showing you here is actually specific to four hertz uh, modulation of this gamma. So if I look at the neighboring frequencies, I don't see it. And that's quite consistent with what we, um, we saw in behavior, this alternation in processing as a function of time. So, um, so I think that um, the evidence are suggesting that our initial model is seemingly relevant. The physiology is supporting this uh, idea that uh, when faced with this distributed attention uh, scenario, individuals alternate with their uh, ability to process well uh, one stimulus versus the other at around four hertz. Uh, this was kind of the longest part in the talk because I think it sets a lot of the ground. I, I would like to now tell you about a couple of newer studies that um, that um, have came out of this research program. And the first, um, and I will say the big project here, is trying to come up with how temporal structure can help us understand the brain. How temporal structure could form a kind of domain general principle when thinking about how different systems interact or different aspects of a certain system are uh, brought about. And in the next uh, study, what I chose to look at is to go beyond spatial selection. I was able to show you papers from the 90s with recordings from V2 on how bias competition looks. I was able to kind of uh, uh, very confidently show you how we think about receptive fields and competition within them um, and, and, and demonstrated that temporal structure seems to negotiate competition in receptive fields. When we move away from spatial attention, we're, uh, it's kind of a brave move because we actually don't have all the architecture completely sorted out. Uh, so what do I mean when I say beyond spatial selection? Um, in this study, we asked whether sampling goes beyond spatial attention, looking at um, competition that could happen within uh, a receptive uh, field when the objects are not defined by space, okay? So, um, so we chose uh, this flavor of attention, feature-based attention. And now what we have here are uh, moving dots. So this is just a static representation of a red cloud and a blue cloud. The arrows are indicating that they're moving in different directions. They're not actually on the screen. And I'll show you an example of an exaggerated illustration of the stimuli right away. So what we did is we had people basically see two objects that occupy the same space. Um, so you see here an example trial, 
the blue dots uh, come up and then the red dots come up and there's like a brief, it looks like a white flash here, but actually in the experiment, it was kind of a, a desaturation of the color. So it's still a very difficult target to detect. And um, it's also titrated, so we make sure it's difficult for all participants and not all of the clouds, uh, not all of the cloud changes colors. So only 50% of blue cloud, for example, would change color. And that is in order to avoid a situation where someone could just trap one middle element. So people have to kind of integrate these two objects and uh, color and motion are defining these objects, not space. And here is the at a glance experimental design. We have the blue coming on. It's a behavioral study again. So we need to do this trick with the reset. And this is why the red cloud comes second. When the red cloud comes in, we are assuming that an onset is a form of a reset. We then look at the, um, the different uh, time points and we could put targets in several different time points as a function of this particular reset time, either in the red cloud or in the blue cloud. And um, right, um, and this is basically what we find. So I'm showing you the spectral representation of the two cloud with the first cloud and the second cloud, blue and red. And as you can see here too, we seem to have evidence for temporal structure in the unfolding of the selection process. Um, I will say as a side, just for fun, that um, I've shown you the one cloud uh, example in the beginning of the talk with the grating. That was a separate study. In this study, we also had the one cloud example just to see that you know, moving to moving dots doesn't change everything. And um, we basically see that when we have one cloud, the significant temporal structure is consistent with an eight hertz uh, in the spectrum. So we could kind of modify and say something goes beyond spatial attention, um, even uh, when we're not limited to spatial competition, we seem to have a similar dynamic with an eight hertz uh, sampling um, dividing to four hertz uh, when two objects are competing but are defined by features. So at this point, I will turn to the most recent uh, paper that we've published in this line of work. And uh, now we're going, um, to another interesting case. Now, at this point, um, the suggestion is that sampling is a mechanism that allows us to negotiate competitive interactions. When we have a competitive interaction, if we care to look at the town course of it, we are likely to find some kind of unfolding that will be uh, temporally structured. If there's competition and both objects are relevant, we will probably see, um, we will probably see kind of an alternation uh, between the two. Um, now, um, the next study tries to see, okay, how early do these competitive interactions actually result in a sampling dynamics? And also, in all the cases I've shown you so far, the studies uh, basically had two things on the screen. Subjects knew they need to negotiate competition between two things, except for the one object, but, uh, but uh, in all the cases where we had uh, the four hertz rhythm. So, uh, so we're moving now to some, the, the lowest uh, level in the visual uh, hierarchy where we actually see competitive interactions. Um, and the earliest visual selection site, uh, um, as far as I uh, understand the visual system, is eye channels. Now, eye channels are quite interesting. Um, and there's actually quite exciting uh, work that is being done uh, these days. And I will just kind of briefly motivate uh, the study. So, um, and this is actually work that is happening more or less simultaneously as we're thinking of these ideas. But um, as we were um, kind of working on our own data, we have noticed that there are a couple of groups in the United States that are starting to look at eye channel competition in uh, physiology. And what they find is something that might look quite familiar, namely that you know your neurons, your monocular neurons, uh, will always have a preferred eye. And the preferred eye is exactly as we did before with the Kelatsi 90s examples. The preferred eye will be um, exemplified by the fact that we have um, uh, an eye that, that the neuron responds to. And then when a stimulus appears in the other eye, in the same space, but in the other eye, there is no response in this neuron. Although there is no response in this neuron, if we now show both eyes the stimulus, the, the neuron, which is getting its preferred eye, right, um, will actually show a similar dynamic that we saw previously when things appear together in a spatial receptive field. And of course, needless to say, but maybe I will say it in other, anyhow, the animal 
be it human or primate, doesn't really have awareness of the eye of origin, right? If I were to show you, um, you know, a stimulus in one eye, particularly if it's a brief stimulus, you wouldn't know if the, the stimulus was uh, appearing in both eyes or in one eye. So this is really an interesting uh, kind of opportunity to ask about these processes in the absence of any aware, um, aware um, kind of cog cognitive awareness. Um, and then the other thing I should also mention is that Zhao Ping Li um, has, um, has shown that eye channels can uh, serve as a cue for attention. So if we uh, present a cue to one eye, um, there are some evidence uh, that, uh, sorry, if you present a search array to, 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 to one eye, but one item is in the other eye, then there is evidence that will capture your attention. So the eye channels could be a, an attentional capture cue. So what did we do? Uh, we're back to one object and uh, it's basically the same task that I've shown you before. We have the reset and we have the target. Uh, critically, um, all the good stuff is coming through a Profix projector where we actually have a chance to polarize uh, the uh, light beam such that some of the inputs come into one eye and other inputs come into the other um, eye. And this is the, uh, the design at a glance. So we have people wearing 3D um, glasses, standard 3D glasses, which is nice because you could also do this in the MEG and you could also, the, no, no interruption at all. Um, and we have, a, for example, a right eye reset with a right eye target. So that would be um, kind of the same eye condition um, as opposed to uh, the right eye reset and the left eye target. So this would be the reset is in the right eye, left eye is getting the target, and all these vertical lines indicate the fact that we're doing exhaustive sampling. And when we do this, we basically find um, that the accuracy spectra shows a four hertz fluctuation. Um, so this is kind of interesting and could really have a lot of um, implications on the generative model of, um, of, um, of rhythmic sampling where it comes from. We know that the site of competition as early as LGN, V1, depends on which paper you read, already seems to have competition resolved in this temporally structured manner. Um, and, uh, and of course, I think it's also important to say this is an unaware process entirely. So I don't believe that people strategically could have sampling at eight hertz, but I think it's important to demonstrate. So this is even in the absence of any aware competition like this. This is a, quite a, a process that can be resolved, I would argue, in kind of a very local way if you think of the neural circuits. So I would like to just kind of summarize this part. How am I doing for time? Oh, okay, good. So I, I would like to summarize this part and then kind of do this crazy whirlwind of looking at other uh, work that we're doing in the lab and just say that, um, okay, so this is the language circle. So I will just say this is the Vanessen Fellman diagram of the visual hierarchy. Everybody's well aware of it. Basically a diagram showing how complicated vision scientist world is, right? Um, but I'd like to use it because I think the work that I've shown you right now really tries to climb up, make very specific predictions in terms of the neuroanatomy. Here I was showing you psychophysics that are targeting monocular neurons, which is, you know, there's one or two regions of the brain where that could actually be uh, implicated. And what we're seeing is that at this level, we seem to show temporally structured uh, uh, coordination of the selection process. Um, previously, um, we have shown that the spatial receptive field level, we and actually many others have shown that that, uh, that type of competition also seems to be resolved in tem with temporal structure. If we go up to regions that are, um, you have to pick if you're going with your color sensitive or motion sensitive, but, but either way, it's like mid-level vision. There too, when you have to select based on these cues, we seem to see this uh, temporal structure is governing the, uh, the selection process. Um, other people looking at TEO and monkey, um, they're beautiful figures I could show you. Um, we start to see this in other people's older papers. Um, there are two, we, um, when two things are competing, we see this type of temporal structure. And um, in, a, um, in, a tr uh, in a trans piece that uh, me and Daniele, the student who's pioneered some of this work, um, we are kind of trying to make the, the point that, you know, um, it's possible that we could actually see 
Competitive interaction at very high levels in the hierarchy. So uh, whoever wondered what's at the top of the visual hierarchy, well, the campus is at the top of the visual hierarchy. But um, but if you look at uh, at work from the Mosher's uh, team, you actually see that um, they, they did this absolutely cool study, the teleportation study, where they had animals learn one environment, map their space cell kind of a situation for it. And then they learned another environment, map the space, the place cells for that environment, but actually were then able to switch back and forth between the environments immediately. And what they saw is that these attractor states of one environment versus the other were at the moment of switch was uh, alternating at these frequencies. So imagine, I mean, the hippocampus doesn't go through these things much. Maybe when you wake up jet lagged in some weird, <laughs> you know, after a long trip that might happen to you. But, uh, but um, you know, in these experimentally controlled ways, you could also show that even if you have two attractor states representing space, two different spaces that are, are having this reset moment, you're actually able to see this type of um, switch. So, um, and then finally, uh, I, I will say, I'm adding this here, um, kind of centered around uh, the frontal part of the parietal frontal network. Um, I think it will be very interesting in the coming years to see how this temporal structure might be a player in orchestrating exploration as well as sensation. And these hypotheses have been, um, are being explored, but also have been put, put forth by Ian uh, Feeblecorn and Sabine Kastner. Um, I wrote the paper about the uh, generative models. Um, I will just go through it uh, very briefly. Um, and if you're interested, you could take a look at it. But I think when we think about where this is coming from, um, the jury's out. <laughs> I think there's some people that would talk about a central mechanism. Um, and I think there's some evidence for that, uh, even from our own group. Like if you think of the feature-based attention finding, or uh, work in audition, which I will tell you about in a second, um, that kind of necessitates a sampler or some kind of temporally structured generator that is not a local mechanism. At the same time, I think that our recent work on the eye channels, as well as other people's very fine recordings in, 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 in visual cortex show how competitive interactions, lateral inhibition could actually result in this dynamic also locally. And so these kind of are two visual representations of that. If you wanna read more about that, welcome to my very short, uh, completely unburdening dispatch on the matter. Um, and this final section uh, really kind of takes us uh, kind of into the more uh, front line of things that are going on in the lab and, um, and things that could also relate to things you think about. But really, if we're searching for an organizing mechanism, and we would like an organizing mechanism to be relevant to the entire cognitive system, not just to the visual cortex, right? Because our world isn't that modular, right? We study it as such, but... And, and spatial approaches, I think, also force us into the systems, to system-specific science. But if we're looking at temporal structure, we actually stand a chance to look at coordination of different systems. Then we uh, started taking steps into um, other modalities, namely the auditory modality and the, um, the tactile modality. Um, so looking at domain generality uh, of sampling, uh, there I have a DFG funded uh, project that actually focuses on investigating these questions in congenitally blind individuals. The point being, okay, most of us have a visual modality and if this is such a dramatic principle in vision, um, if we were to find it in audition, there's always a possibility that it's the visual system that kind of really shapes whatever it is you're seeing in audition. So we kind of targeted this, uh, this population that never had visual experience. And I'm happy to show, uh, show you data maybe in the individual meetings, but uh, this journey has been super interesting. As part of the JFK project, we're also looking, for example, at, um, we're also looking at language processing and, uh, uh, in these uh, individuals, we're also looking at eye movements and motor exploration behaviors in this uh, in this um, population. My lab also has an interest in blinks and blind people blink just as much as sighted people blink. And the question of why they do that is a kind of open-ended question. Um, but one thing that we have done is done this auditory version of our studies. And we have a curious finding. 
which is that uh, in the sighted individuals, whether they are running these experiments with their eyes open, whether they're running these experiments with their eyes blindfolded, or whether they are actually blind but only acquired blind, we do not find the sampling dynamics in audition. When we turn to the congenitally blind sample, we do. So this is a paper that is about to be submitted. And basically we find, we find this dynamic there um, as well as a few other curious findings, not what we expected to see, but it's very interesting. And we're, uh, I'd be very happy to show you a little bit more about that if you would like in the Q&A. So, um, and yes, I already said that we're looking at sampling and active sensing. So we're starting to incorporate the motor system, motor exploration in looking at these systems. I'm gonna zoom out and maybe take two more minutes to, uh, to tell you a little bit about other things going on, um, just so you hear a little bit about that, maybe follow up later in our individual meetings or um, otherwise by email if uh, we don't have one scheduled. But uh, in the lab, time perception has been kind of something that I was hoping to uh, target with my kind of systems approach. Uh, and in uh, my investigation on time perception, uh, one of the major things that we are looking at is the sensory role in timing. Yes, I'm a systems neuroscientist at heart. Uh, and, and we have various interesting pieces of evidence such that, for example, when we blink, we lose our estimates of time. So this is kind of an unaware, involuntary behavior we all engage in. We're losing like 100 to 200 milliseconds. And if you were to judge, make temporal judgments, that actually would be reflected. So these 200 milliseconds that you're missing while you're blinking, uh, this decrease in your visual processing, cortically established in other, other people's studies, also has a consequence on your time perception. You, um, and again, there could have been a whole talk about that. I'm happy to talk about it more later. Um, um, I thank one of my very brilliant uh, graduate students for uh, being around while I was writing the ERC. Um, we were already starting to think about timing. And, he, and I was like, do I keep the motor element in there? Do I keep it out? Is it too many work packages? So, so and he was like, there, we can't keep doing this like very insular systems neuroscience. So if we want to say something about timing, we also should target the motor execution element and look at timing in the motor system, for which we actually have quite an interesting uh, platform, which we've devised to track people's mo movement. Again, trying to go into kind of more naturalistic movement and understand how motor system contributes and is uh, uh, affecting timing. Um, at the physiological level, I'm probing this kind of model of a hierarchy of timing in the brain. And for that, I am actually engaging with patients that have Parkinson's disease, where I get to record from their basal ganglia simultaneously with their uh, scalp uh, EEG signals um, and try to establish how interaerial connectivity um, and maybe also simulatory signatures are informing temporal processes. And this is the, the mini team uh, spearheading this uh, work. Um, finally, and probably most relevant to, uh, to the language circle. Uh, Maya Ingbao, uh, a PhD uh, student in the lab, and Eitan Gossman, a linguist from the functional linguistics department at my institution, have been uh, have taken me to this incredible ride into the world of prosodic processing. Um, and Maya's PhD has really looked into uh, pacing of information and speech, taking two different approaches. One approach um, is looking at acoustic analysis of several languages, so understanding how the temporal structure might be shared between different languages. She specifically is interested in intonation units, um, and, um, and we've already published uh, the beginning of this project, in seven or six languages, I think, in the 2020 paper, showing that it seems to be the case that information is paced um, in a way that is temporally structured or consistent with one piece of new information uh, at a second. Um, by now, uh, she's cooking up a storm, analyzing 47 languages. And when you have 47 languages, even if we find kind of something that is consistent with new information once a second, or one prosodic unit per second, um, it might also be interesting to see whether there are small differences around this uh, pacing of information. And she's going to be in a great position to uh, talk more about this and to describe any such differences. Um, and this is all working with natural speech, of course. 
Um, finally, and most recently, uh, by now available online, uh, with Maya, we've taken, I think, uh, quite a meaningful step towards analyzing EEG signals of, uh, of people processing speech. And this was, uh, again, in collaboration with ATAN, but also in another lab that just had people, uh, lab, which had people listen to stories, basically took their data and managed to kind of bring it into the kind of more traditional analyses practices with some uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, analytic tricks and, uh, and uh, basically do ear analyses of people listening to natural speech. Uh, Maya was supposed to be in SNL. Unfortunately, due to the situation in Israel, she's unable to fly there. But if you're going to the cross-linguistic perspective on processing and learning, uh, find Maya. Her talk is just before the conference dinner. And um, yeah, I mean, I think part of the reason I decided not to give a whole talk about this work is because I'm kind of counting on you all going to this language conference and hearing Maya talk about it herself. If for some crazy idea reason that is not um, afforded, uh, Laris, I highly encourage you to my, invite Maya uh, to talk about her work because it's really uh, has a very unique perspective, very cross-disciplinary. And for me, it's been just a really uh, great uh, ride. So uh, that's uh, the work on pacing information in speech. There are the rhythms that we're all engaging in all the time. And here work, uh, again, led by another graduate student, Lea Snapiri. Um, she has looked at spontaneous motor tempo, and we managed to establish that our rhythm is actually our rhythm. So we have a fingerprint, we have a rhythmic fingerprint with which we behave, um, and it's prevalent in all of our motor behaviors. So Lars impatiently is tapping right now, or maybe he's um, no, thinking, about, he's thinking about, about our each day and paper and his task of paper where they are tapping. Reading. That's a really interesting question. Yeah, really interesting but question. Yeah, so again, a whole other talk, <laughs> which I'm happy to chat about later, but what Lea had people do is they, had, they were tapping, they were walking, they were bouncing on Pilatus balls. Uh, they did it more than one time. So they came a month later, did it again. They did it alone, they did it together. And we find that um, that the motor fingerprint is a thing. It also impacted how sensitive they were to uh, 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 rhythmic entrainment paradigm. Okay, so this is already kind of uh, going into this other domain. They were It affected how they uh, discriminate after a rhythmic train. Um, and it also affected which rhythms they created together. At the same time, when we meet, we do something interesting. We actually go to the population mean. So if we were to start tapping together, we would probably tap around two hertz. But if both of us are faster than the two hertz of the population, we would be just a little bit on the right side of the two hertz mark, okay? So that's uh, uh, part of that is documented in an EJN paper. Um, but uh, uh, there's another paper that will have to be written soon to tell you about that more. Um, and then finally, this fancy sensor that I've built in the lab. Okay. Um, and it's a big glass sensor where we, uh, we are kind of uh, constructing situations where people could create something that is intuitive. It's not natural, because natural actually, they're tr tracking movement. I don't know if you have a movement tracking lab here. If you do, I want to see it later. Uh, but tracking movement has some arbitrariness to it or, or over complexity to it. And what I liked about this, this is an idea inspired by COVID. Uh, this barrier, which is a window, is actually something we're very used to swiping. I mean, we're swiping glass all day long. So imagine yourself standing on one side of a window and another person on the other side of the window, and you're getting these kind of interesting dyadic uh, tasks, also individual tasks, and we're hoping to graduate tapping. Tapping is great. It really is an incredibly powerful and cognitive mode of behavior. But it would be nice to be able to see, okay, if I'm a fast tapper, are my sub-movements, my kind of event boundaries of movement, also faster than another person? So this is work we're doing, uh, among others, in collaboration with Jason Friedman, who's a kinematics expert uh, um, and finally, uh, and with an outlook on more kind of application industry collaborations, we also look at sustained performance, states of being in the zone, and we're trying to see whether we're able to first um, algorithmically uh, detect zone states when you're in kind of state of flow. And we do that with EEG and uh, 
machine learning methodologies. And we're also uh, looking to see whether we could actually kind of influence people's uh, attentional states by introducing uh, rhythm, rhythmic intervention either on their bodies or in their headphones. So that was the whirlwind, uh, hopefully to inform an interesting discussion uh, later. Um, and this is the time to thank you for your sustained attention and uh, to thank my funding sources and my incredible team here color coded by their projects. Maybe I'll just say a word that, um, um, yeah, I, I'd be very happy to take questions. I'm going to say a word now, but I wouldn't want to inhibit you from asking questions, also difficult questions. But this list of people, they're all um, in either uh, state of evacuation, very serious concern uh, of the future um, uh, or uh, drafted to the army. Let's just all join in prayer that they all come back home uh, safely and that uh, science and routine comes back uh, to where it should be um, soon. Uh, and it's just a word to say, your colleagues are not in their normal environment. So um, a shout out to encourage them and um, yeah. And the desk maybe in your labs it might be, might come useful. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. I'm sorry, but I thought it's like the the the, the daily uh, reality of it is kind of conveyed to me with this list list of really people I care a lot about and and are all fine, but, uh, and this is important. Like, I feel like I'm their ambassador now, showing their world, work around the world and, uh, and they want to hear your questions. We bring it on, <laughs> bring it on, bring on the, the difficult questions. They want a couple of questions. Some of them are, have the mental space to be distracted. <laughs> well, thank you for the cool and so inspiring and interesting discussion. So um, the floor is open for questions. And also online, we have the opportunity to post questions in the chat. So if you have a question, please just type it in the chat, like in a short version, and then we can um, give you the microphone online. Um, but maybe there's also questions in the room. Uh, so, if I understand correctly, um, this uh, oscillatory <coughs> sampling <laughs> button has nothing to do with focused attention, right? It's like an automatic uh, process kind of organizes uh, the processing. So, um, does it mean that these uh, oscillations are kind of a general property of neuronal representations in general? Can, can one think about it like that? Yeah, so I would argue exactly as you put it, with whom do I have the honor? Dennis, Dennis, thanks for the question. Um, so, uh, so as as your question insinuates, indeed, I think the evidence that I've presented to you, uh, you know, the story goes, the story goes such that I I talk about attention, but in my little universe, um, when I say focused attention, I could have said ongoing perceptual processing, and even less than that, right? Because if I if I have this even um, you know, even if this competitive interaction is resolved with like a slowing of the sampling, when two things are competing outside my awareness, then uh, then it's a very, very basic reflexive mechanism. Um, I, I'd hate to say to stop there, and but I don't have much more clarity. I'd hate to stop there just because other people, um, including ourselves, uh, show that sometimes when, you know, it's not so trivial to um, uh, to assume a local interaction, um, we also see these type of uh, th this type of alternation. Um, so you could argue maybe because binocular maybe it's all due to the binocular competition, right? Like maybe intrinsic to anything that we're ever seeing is this temporal structure that then will be you know manipulated and maneuvered depending on the task, on the stimuli, and so on and so forth. But I think there's quite a lot of evidence invasive and also our own behavioral uh, to show that th this is not uh, attention as we think about it in psychology books, but rather it is just processing or, uh, or the nature of the representation. Related one. So, and what about non-sensory representations like uh, stimuli that you uh, 
both in working memory but also computers is would there be something similar going on? So I think there is evidence for working memory also uh, demonstrating. I should add those to the references. So there is a, a group in Frankfurt that looked at this, a group in uh, Münster that also, um, or maybe it was... you anymore now it should be working yeah. again <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly where i think at the moment <clears throat> when you think about language that's where it starts people okay. are thinking about units okay. so, time time and like the internal dynamics of the units have them say a memory remembering a sentence or something like that how do you so i think that content right right so at the risk of, you know, stepping into the linguistic work, I would say that, you know, one of the, uh, it's like twice a year, I check with Maya, is it okay that you're in a visual neuroscience lab? Because, you know, I don't know if we have all the tools, but, but it's those moments where she actually kind of very beautifully highlights to me how at least uh, the fraction or the type of uh, linguistics that she comes from is really seeking for the cognitive principles <laughs> which go through neural principles of how information can be organized. So I think that if you consider natural speech, you don't have a lot of analytic tools in the linguistic sense to actually understand what it is that I'm doing when I'm talking. Uh, and bringing in the temporal domain, I think, is a really interesting opportunity. It really opens a huge uh, path for studying use-based linguistics. And that's exactly kind of what we tried to do in our uh, recent paper and what I'm sure Maya will be doing for years on quite impressively. Um, and uh, yeah, so as I stop there, but I, I mean, I could talk more about how really it doesn't seem like these prosodic units seem to follow um, you know, any obvious grammatical structure and so on and so forth on the one hand. And then on the other hand, and this is also important to understand, this is the, this is the mind and the co co cognitive uh, system that is producing these, uh, these rhythms. So I almost feel like it's this question, like was math invented or discovered, right? <laughs> like it's, it's um, you know, I think an argument sometimes is put forth about um, studies like the work that now Ding did with the the very simple um, uh, syllables make words, make sentences, very structured stimuli, etc. Um, and that this is often given as an example of how you know syntax can hold it all. Um, but I actually think that you know when we listen to these stimuli, we we, we generate something that is not quite what's in the stimulus. And um, the last paper that Maya um, has put out is actually showing that there is obviously acoustic structure um, uh, that is kind of in the stimulus that, uh, which is created by a brain, but never mind that for a moment. There is acoustic boundaries that are, um, that are gonna affect your brain responses, but you also have this extra response that the brain is generated, generating in the processing of the materials, which is not accounted for by the acoustics. Um, and I think it is indeed a temporal domain that allows us to, to get to it, um, to these questions. I think if she keeps that perspective, that will have a lot of successes in the future. It's I think for the more theoretically inspired language people, it's extremely hard to take it because the representations that they are assuming they are incompatible with so many things because they are there, right? And they have these assumptions about, oh, that's how the abstract structures look and that's yeah. how semantic memory is organized for language and all that. And it's all purely theoretic. And now reconciling that with something as symmetric and simplistic as the pacemaker 
it's extremely hard, I think. For also with universality, right? Yeah. That is also very difficult. <laughs> Why I'm very excited for us to look at these, um, the newly kind of published uh, databases with a lot of different language systems. Then you could actually maybe even, like, I think this is another uh, fun part of working with people who are actually linguists, right? Because I'm not a linguist, but I mean, we're really open. Like we might replicate what we found with the six or seven languages we checked. We might see that it's exactly the same all over the globe, but we're very much open to, to, to learning on the ways in which language systems might interact with this and might create some variability that could then be accounted for by, you know, the decades of work on language systems that can help us understand why one language might be a little bit lower or a little bit higher in the pacing of information. But again, naturally, when you take this cognitive perspective, uh, you you lean towards the universal uh, universal uh, kind of um, implementation of the system, and uh, you will just have to stay tuned. <laughs> Next question. I would like to stay on the, on the topic. And um, can you ask about this organizational principles uh, of um, um, how we organize representations of time? You told us a wonderful story about dimensional fluctuations uh, at specific rate and how then representations alternate faster rate. And I'm wondering if this like at this lower rate, like essentially this um, alternating representations are um, in anti-phase, as you show, uh, behaviorally and perhaps even neurally, sometimes we have anti-phase relationships. Um, so the question is, uh, what is, is there, or what would be the organizational principle that can essentially order these representations in time, if there's one, because we have we've talked about attention that our, uh, um, attention can bias the competition for perception, but also you mentioned the case in which you have both stimuli and centers, you have to choose between one or the other, and you don't have a specific bias in that case. Would there be something like um, implicit knowledge of the structure of the world helping you into like um, separating the representations and then depending on the current state of your brain selecting Right. So I'll kind of I'll, I'll I'll repeat part of your question to see if I'm on track and then uh, and then attempt an answer. But I think um, or maybe I'll rephrase what you tried to rephrase in what I say. So. Uh, right. So what I've shown is a story of some kind of temporal structure that is kind of more or less at eight, eight hertz. That seems to govern and organize uh, and negotiate difficult situations such as competitive interactions. Um, and of course, in my world, there's like one object and then there's two objects, you know, they could be shared in space, they could be in different eye channels, but, th but this is kind of the limited world that I have studied so far. And the world is, is made out of many, many more, right? Uh, so of course the fact that I work with one and two objects is a necessity that comes from, you know, being able to measure these things. And that's kind of my limited, um, starting point. Um, I will also say that this alternation was the first discovery. And then uh, I tried to make sense of it. And I understood that I'm assuming that there is actually an eight hertz that is being divided. So I headed out to study the eight hertz. Do I find it? That was actually the most kind of very parsimonious prediction that I made. And, and it panned out in, in by now three different data sets. So we have this eight hertz currency. Now, how do I go about the world? Why do I uh, explore um, A before B uh, and so on and so forth? I think the point we need to kind of hold in mind is this is the beating drum of, uh, of the exploration, of sensory exploration. And I didn't show you any data for this, but I think the hypothesis would say, you know, maybe the good moment for apprehending something is the bad moment to move on to the next thing. And maybe the moment where I'm moving to the next thing, that's the moment where I'm very poor at actually discerning or perceiving, right? So the idea is it's possible that these frequencies are kind of packets of processing that are separated by an opportunity to actually move, to shift. Now, many, maybe many of you are aware of uh, theories like uh, communication through coherence, which is, of course, one of the inspirations for this body of work. 
Um, and in communication through coherence, one of the ideas is that you have a network and it is synchronized as long as you are indeed kind of attending something. But the question you need to often ask is, okay, so, and the synchrony happens at higher frequencies. But the question you need to ask is, okay, but how did this network come about? And how long are we gonna stay here? Like, how can I ever go and kind of restructure the network because I'm an adaptive animal. I need to respond to the next thing. I need to make predictions. I have prior knowledge. There's lots of, lots of things on my agenda. And so the, I think the, the functional necessity of this type of mechanism is to kind of pro provide the opportunity, provide the moment where, um, where you know, if, if perception is pulsating, it means that in between the pulsa pulsations, I'm able to, to go on. Why do I go on? I mean, I think, you know, all the things that you stated are valid reasons. And probably we could experimentally manipulate that or we could make predictions as well. I think one of the nice things about the studies that we're doing now, which will incorporate free viewing, so people will be kind of exploring uh, more complex uh, arrays, is that we will be doing uh, um, both tracking of when do you move your eyes and when do you have benefits for perception, but you could also then look at, for example, the representation of a to be gazed at, right? So all this notion of predictive remapping of the environment and so on and so forth, we will also have access to that. So that could help me answer your question, right? Because maybe I already know that you're about to, um, to shift to the other visual field from your brain activity. And then we will see, you know, how do you time that action? with respect to uh, a predictive uh, plan that you have. So, so we, we, we're in the business of describing the system, the, the ultimate reasons of why, why are you moving your eyes to the other visual field? I don't know. <laughs> and JDP language, how do you, why do you not speak so rhythmically as in the deep environments? Why do you use different temporal variations in the same life? Like, so this is interesting, right? So if I'm sure you're very well aware of the literature, right? So the literature on that camp started with a very strong shout out for syllables are at five hertz, right? That was kind of, they really kind of hammered that in. I think that camp specifically, from what I see at the conferences, is now talking about some variability there, which is interesting. And it's always good to open your heart to some variability, individual differences, perhaps. I think it's interesting. Um, um, and then... I mean, I think if Maya were here, she would say, well, of course you need to work with this uh, variability and your syllable length needs to change because, because you need to know when I'm about to finish what I'm about to say and when am I going to start saying something that you really need to tune into, right? I mean, if you look at prosodic units, then you can easily describe how the temporal variation within a prosodic unit serves a cue for you to know when is the prosodic unit over and when is it uh, when is it going to start, and the syllables are the are the drivers of of this right or the syllables the acoustics what have you, uh, not necessarily the breaks not necessarily the pauses but uh, but right I mean I'm actually <laughs> throughout my research and maybe it's a little bit of a shared sentiment all my experiments that I've shown you um, you might have wondered. You know, why does she have this strong grating on the screen? Why does she have in the auditory stimuli also? We have like a burst of noise, which has a little something embedded in it. I mean, I really believe in studying a system that is processing. So I think, you know, and, and this is kind of consistent with, for example, pause length is not necessarily serving the, the same function as the variability that you might see in the speech utterances themselves. Uh, I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. Re yeah. I don't know where you all stand in this, in this like uh, syllables come at five Hertz and you know, how open our filters are to. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's kind of an intuition that was directly refuted. I no, think. that's, that's the kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think you're you're exactly on the right track. Each of us you have these rhythmic parts and it fades and then you have something expected and so exactly. Right. That's that's what predictive coding would say is the prediction error and prediction error for Shannon would say this is information. This yeah. is 
this is good. I want this. I don't want to avoid the unpredictable. Either right to learn new things about the world, but predict everything that's very safe, but it's also very boring. And we know that the brain is sensitive exactly to those moments, right? <laughs> so if you compare, you know, and this is, again, if you look at the brain signatures uh, around uh, the ending of, uh, of an information unit, so to speak, intonation unit, you see that basically when the final word ends, there's already a difference in the brain, right? So, so there's a high sensitivity to that moment in the processing of ongoing speech. And this is natural speech, yeah? Yeah. 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 Okay. okay, I think that's pretty quick. So, um, the first one is uh, in your little toy model of the visual system, especially at the beginning, basically assume that uh, in early visual areas, everything is represented, but in the higher level areas, you only have the uh, attendance symbols or the specifically. Depends how close you're looking at your kinds of watching, but yes. Depends right. on the okay. <laughs> but what, so what about what about unattended stimuli? Are they really not uh, represented? Oh, they're, oh, they're represented. So well. yeah. So so I think this is not me, but like decades of bias competition research showing that um, bias competition is most relevant for the levels in the hierarchy that are actually dealing with having to represent more than one thing in the receptive field. So it's very spatial, this model. But what it means is that in the early visual areas, you're attending, you're not attending, it's all there, right? So- yeah, Right, but in the higher level areas, if you still have a representation of So again, I'm gonna go back to uh, basically this uh, slide, which is seminal, has influenced me a lot. Uh, probably my the third slide of this talk. Um, right. So this is right. This is more or less the measurement. And OK, maybe I will have to scratch my head and think of ways in which it might need to be revisited because it's been 20 years. But uh, but what you see here is that the yellow line is generally indistinguishable from the dash line, the green dash line. And what that means is that um, faced with a target that is relevant, so the first image here is relevant, the response is as if the other stimulus does not exist there. Now, we, I could have shown the more tricky example, which is now attend to the non-preferred stimulus, and then you would get a line indistinguishable from the blue. So although the most favored vertical line is in your receptive field, you're not responding to it. So, so, so that's kind of the most uh, kind of, yeah, strongest. So in this case, you already mean higher level? This is B2. V2 is, uh, and the relevant parameter here, can I fit to stimuli and characterize the receptive fields and the size of the receptive field? So V2 is an um, accessible site for the monkey here. Um, I think that if you uh, read Sabine Kastner and Dan Beck's work from like a few years later, where they try to do similar work, similar logic, but use fMRI, and then, you know, you could say a lot of bad things about fMRI, but you do get the whole brain. So if you figured out a way to, to investigate competitive interactions, you can now talk about V1 and V2 and V4 and everything. So I think uh, there, uh, the, the conclusion would be V4 uh, and uh, plus minus one in the hierarchy would be the regions which, you know, in the world of the screen that is being presented in these experiments, uh, that would be where the, the competitive interaction is maximal for things that you tell your subjects to attend to. I'm sure that if you start doing weird studies with super small things, you might shift it. And then the other thing you also would see in these uh, fMRI studies is that you could manipulate things like the stimulus size or the spacing and undo the competitive interaction. So, 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 so they've done this. So they've looked at, you know, what happens. Can you shift the, 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 the difference between uh, they do a kind of a manipulation, either things are presented simultaneously or sequentially. So in the simultaneous case, you expect competitive interaction. And then if you space them out, you will only see it, you know, in the next object representing area. Uh, if they're closer together, you will see it at V4, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And the, the other question I had was uh, in this first study that you showed with the reset events, right? You, you showed that basically at the reset event, accuracy was super low. But mm -hmm. what I noticed was that uh, accuracy would also already decrease basically before 
uh, the reset event, even, even lower than the fluctuations you observe afterwards, right? Right. Um, right. So this is the pro the temporal profile of the masking. And uh, I agree that it's quite long, but uh, but it's still shorter than the response time. So it's possible that the representation is fragile until you provide the response. I mean, that would be one way to account for it. Yeah. Sure. Ah, we have a question online. Yay. Um, Hi. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the talk. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I wrote it into the chat already. Uh, one was more a uh, terminolo terminological question that regards those two terms. The one that's maybe a bit longer. I'm not so firm with the one by Fiebelkorn from like Kastner's lab. Uh, but you kind of had both listed active sensing by Schröder and uh, et al. But also functional coordination. And I was just wondering what's your take on which of those two terms fits better. And the second question regarded more like something you said towards the very end of your talk, when you said that you actually saw the such like temporal patterns um, only in those, I mean, it was on like in the domain of auditory performance. And then you contrasted those um, being visually deprived and those that had um, their eyes closed. And um, what's your take on that? Yeah, why why this would be the case, basically. Thanks a lot. Okay, so, uh, so I guess this, the slide where I talk about um, active sensing and functional coordination, um, uh, yeah, I'm almost curious to kind of think of uh, like uh, how, uh, to me, those are two ways to say the same things, but maybe you're asking about some particular discerning aspect, right? So, so it relates to this, right? So the point would be, um, I've shown you a lot of perceptual studies, but it's 2023 and my thoughts uh, kind of are, are, I'm seeking to integrate into this picture, uh, motor exploration. And I'm opening my heart to doing more ecological studies where I actually could simultaneously track what I've shown you with the particular timing of micro saccades and of eye movements. Now, I will say something I didn't say during the talk. Um, all the findings that I've shown you are not accounted for by eye movements. We always track eyes and we always see, you know, whether the, the micro saccades might be kind of fitting you know, the times and so on and so forth. But those studies are not really, they're not really letting the motor system do what it does. So, so in that sense, we're, we're going to have more to say about that later. And I think that incorporating the motor system in these type of studies is consistent with active sensing, understanding that our sensations are affected and affecting the motor exploration, the sensory motor loop. And I'm not the only person to say it. Ian Fiebelkorn says it as well, and he calls it functional coordination. Um, so that's kind of the context of, uh, of the point. But if there's something more specific that you think discerns these two options, then I'd be, I'd be very happy to think about it. But for me, this is just uh, kind of making sure that I'm in context. The second question asks me to hypothesize what's going on with the blind. And I think that's really interesting. I have... Uh, um, really a manuscript in it. It's very, very final stages uh, on my hard drive. Um, and we hope to submit it in a couple of weeks or so. Um, and I think that when we talk about uh, finding that is prevailed only in congenitally blind and not in wired blind and not in blindfolded and not in sighted, then we have to turn to questions of neural plasticity. Right, because we know that when you don't have sensory inputs, then there the brain is developing slightly differently. Uh, it's working with the inputs that it has, auditory and tactile, and uh, and so on. Um, but it's using the same substrate. Now, um, there is a researcher called Amila Medi who has done a lot of work on congenitally blind, uh, and I think his uh, outlook is useful here because what he basically uh, demonstrates is that uh, when he investigates congenitally blind individuals, uh, he finds that often the same brain regions that would be solving a visual task, like faces versus places, are now going to be activated in the blind 
for a faces versus places task, which is not mediated by the visual system. Now, his claim, I think, is, uh, is really interesting and challenging to the field, uh, would be that this substrate, uh, LOC, ventral stream visual cortex, is not a visual cortex, actually, but rather uh, is, uh, he refers to it as a task machine. So the task machine doesn't have the visual uh, input, but something about the neural architecture is still dedicated to discerning faces versus houses. Now, uh, if I adopt this approach, then I would have to say, okay, we know these, uh, these uh, subjects have a sensory input and they have this visual cortex. Um, now, this visual cortex might have uh, an oscillation in it, right? And this oscillation typically is impacting the dynamics that I've shown you in sighted individuals. But for the blind, faced with a difficult discrimination task within embedded noise, that because this could be suggestive that it is the visual cortex, which is repurposed to other senses, is actually performing this task. So that I think is the best I have, but if there are other ideas, I'd be very happy to hear. I will say that, and I'm not sure how it implicates uh, or works out in our, uh, in our study, uh, we only have 12 subjects, um, uh, but, uh, but six of them have a shared etiology for the blindness. Um, uh, namely, they were uh, premature babies that were exposed to too much oxygen in the incubator. So this is something that uh, the medical system doesn't talk about a lot, but um, there's a, an entire age group in the developed world. Right now, not so much, but but I'm sure it's like this also in Germany. Um, uh, in the Western world, there's an entire few decades of an age group which whose lives were saved thanks to oxygen given in the incubator, but their retinas were blasted, basically, because it's just this is uh, what happens when you have too much uh, oxygen. This is interesting because it means that maybe things like waves, retinal waves, actually they might have had them as uh, embryos. So, I mean, there's some uh, kind of developmental vision science there that, that might be interesting. Uh, but I think that actually makes our sample reasonably uh, well. Right now in the Western world, we don't have this uh, so much. In the developing world, this is, uh, there is more equipment that you could save more babies. And they are congenitally blind often. So this is uh, just another interesting fact. Probably no one think was 10 years ago or so. Uh, uh, he, was, he was giving a talk here and he develops prosthesis for the blind. Yes, that's a male medi. Yeah, yeah. He was here and he was like, yeah. there was a line pointing upwards and all that. I think he was building complex images. Yeah. I think that's uh, like that some of the studies of uh, faces versus faces were, yeah. I forget the name, he has cute names for his product, but uh, yeah, it was this uh, sound uh, yes. translated uh, images. I to, may, may I ask one or two more questions because it's kind of bad because we're, we're torturing you for half an hour. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> okay. um, and then both about the, well, I have some, it's all about reading and vision, and I know nothing about reading, but let's see. Um, reading in blind, because we were mentioning the repurposing of their uh, visual rhythm audition, and uh, you didn't see the rhythm in audition, and then non and the sighted individuals, and then you saw the rhythm in audition in the blind, right? That's what you said. Now, how about, how about, uh, how about uh, reading by? Uh, how, what do you expect there? Do you get that rhythm? Yeah. So right now I have a student. Her name is Danielle Filmon. She is uh, doing basically the study we did in the blind in audition, but she's doing it in touch. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, I mean, we definitely ask whether they have broad experience, but I will say that I, uh, like you're reminding me to try and make the connection. So um, I think braille reading uh, blind individuals, I think with technology, there are a little bit less of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we probably should look into like trying to understand uh, like the temporal structure yes. uh, that is going on. I'm, I, I actually don't know much about it. No, me neither. And I'm wondering, you see, for, for graphene systems, 
information th there's information theoretic work on how much bits you actually digest when you have a single saccard, right? Because that's another bottleneck. Mm -hmm. I mean, the one yes. thing is being able to do 200 milliseconds, you know, but the other thing is how much, how many pixels or whatever yeah. you do. Yeah. Um, you can eat within uh, one saccade. And now that might differ between Braille and, uh, and actual uh, writing systems. Maybe it's even, maybe, maybe Braille is richer, maybe it's... Well, you know, it's a cognitive bottleneck, I would argue. We have 10 fingers, right? So technically you could be like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying, uh, I mean, we've been humbled by the ta tactile domain. The tactile experiments have been planned way, way, way back when, before we thought one object, we were thinking two objects. Uh, and we're now, I think, two or three papers later, after having to do some basic systems neuroscience on touch, we can start doing these studies with the blind. One of the biggest uh, uh, conclusions that we've had is that we cannot uh, work with two object type experiments because the integration in the sensory modality is vast. So, you know, Allegedly, you could have thought, okay, if you have like a braille uh, length, you could have put all your fingers at once. Now, what do, what do you do when you do that? Like, and how do they actually distribute attention over all those locations? I think, from my impression, is they typically use two fingers. Um, and there's like, and I think one finger does one thing and the other does something else. Once a blind person explained this to me, I think one of them is like, you know, kind of finding the end and the other one is kind of filling in the detail. There's something kind of stereotypical in how they scan. But I think these are really good questions that I'm eager to get back to. And I think the moment Daniel will resume experimentation, we should probably further interview the blind individuals and hear from them a little bit more about how they do it and maybe even kind of take a photo of them reading Braille. Lena has published this year, I believe, um, EG, but she saw the theta, what we think is the theta rhythm over the visual cortex during naturalistic reading. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the saccadic one, but she also saw a slower one. So like in Maya's ball, mm -hmm. kind of, we were thinking that's kind of, that's the chunking rhythm, you know? Mm -hmm. and it's just an observation, you know? And, but um, could be like when you mentioned the, the, the mm -hmm. Maya readers that finding the end, yeah. that's kind of what they do, right? So they delineate the phrase or intonation or whatever unit it is, doesn't matter how we call it, right? Um, and then they can fill it up, like you say. I guess maybe one other source of information which you are all experts on is what would be the difference between uh, listening to an audiobook and listening to speech, right? So, I mean, I don't know, Lena, wh whether your study was with uh, natural speech or no, it's reading, so it's text, but it was it was just text, text, like written, written speech, not uh, written text, not uh, transcribed speech. Uh, so that's an, I think it might be a, an important difference. Um, in terms of parsing of information, right? All of us have sat through a talk where someone was reading their manuscript, right? That happened. I think in Germany, it actually happens a lot, no? No, but we all sat there and had issues. Like, it's not easy. Maybe you're, you've evolved to deal with it in uh, some cultures compared to others. But we, you know, when I, when we give a talk, we use a lot of uh, different temporal cues in order to make sure that this is something that can be processed as in speech. Uh, when we're dealing with text, it's a little bit different and I'm not sure if the temporal constants exactly uh, jump from one to the other. Uh, but I will imagine that if you, for example, have an audiobook versus speech, that would be an interesting and simple comparison and probably someone did it or maybe incidentally. Those people who try to find if you're like the preferred tapping frequency, from what I have, I mean, in audition, like a pacemaker rhythm for audition and like finding your, your favorite teacher that speaks your perfect mm -hmm. rhythm, you know, it wasn't particularly responsible. Understanding which uh, speech works best for which brain. At individual level, yes. I think it wasn't looking for the synthetic and it was, it was a pain, I think. I don't know what they keep coming. The Strauss and Constance try to... This is individual differences in preferences of speech. Yeah. Right, so there, there's actually this field of listening. I don't know if you're aware of it, speed but there's... Uh, not speed listening, but uh, there's like people building statistical models to understand 
um, kind of to account for variability in my ability to listen to a given uh, speaker. And so how much variability has to do with my, uh, my preferences, how much of the variability is accounted for the clarity of that speaker. And then there's the secret component, which is how much variability is accounted for by something unique that is happening between one listener and one speaker, right? So you do these round robin type designs where people, you know, talk or listen to, or have to rate. It's even sometimes it's studies that are completely questionnaire based. So it could be, right? You basically take people and you ask them to rate someone's uh, uh, clarity of speech. And, and you, from that are able to glean their own preferences, the merits or feats of different speakers. And then finally be left with some kind of dyadic uh, compatibility in listening. So. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what you would think, but right? it's not a one-way street when you're like in a diet. You're gonna try to find pace that yeah. both enjoy, and at some point, you know, the lectures of course hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will say that for the tapping studies, we also have uh, footage. That actually might be a good. Uh, it's a good task for someone looking for a task these days. Uh, we have footage of the pairs talking, so we had them chat a little bit uh, and we also had them play some kind of association game so we have their speech rate and uh, we could actually extend the motor tempo work into the speech realm not extensively but we have a little bit of footage there so that's a good idea thanks already <laughs> she has studied i told you about the the Language recognition mm -hmm. saying, I don't know whether it's processed newborns EEG data it looks like low pass filter. Right? It's crazy. They really? Yeah, yeah, ah, okay. Data at, at like the three hertz, and that's it. They don't have anything else because they don't. Yeah, so they don't look at the spectrum. But that's very interesting. So, do you know Povansin has newer ideas about prosopagnosia? So this is pretty cool. This is one of the most cool models that I've heard about. It's some years ago, and I'm sure that people have already adopted it in audition, maybe. But the point uh, that Pavan Sinha is doing, he's doing these studies about cataracts, patients, and so on and so forth. And he's also a, a prosopognosia uh, researcher. And uh, basically, what he is saying is that when we're born, we're born with very bad acuity. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is this acuity that is actually helping us guide attention to the right type of information. Right, so the information a baby needs is the very low pass. It doesn't need to know whether you know, uh, whatever you know, one uh, hair of the eyebrow is uh, in mommy's uh, face is mislocated. He needs to recognize who his mother is, who his father is, and so on and so forth. So it's this kind of evolutionary or this um, developmental um, simplification of the system that is exactly matching uh, what uh, what the what the evolutionary needs are at that uh, particular stage. Um, and then uh, the point uh, of prosopognosia is it's possible that these poor babies were born with slightly better acuity. So they have seen a little bit too much, so to speak, too many detail, and therefore their attention has not been guided to learn the important configural uh, organization of a face. Um, and, uh, and that's basically like, so they had this idea and I didn't follow up on it, but they had this idea of going to neonatal departments and, and, and tracking and seeing the variability. Cause I mean, you know, there is variability everywhere, you know, there will be variability and the percentage of prosopognosia and the degrees of prosopognosia might match what you see in these babies. Now, how does this relate to audition? Well, you could argue that for a baby that is be, that is um, even before birth, actually, right? Because you might not be seeing much uh, in, in utero, but you are definitely hearing stuff, but you're hearing it in a very muffled way. So now it's not exactly a developmental uh, hindrance, though you're telling me that their brains are also low pass. So maybe in concert with that, but in utero, a baby will be hearing mostly the frequencies uh, that you describe and lower, right? Uh, um, and it's possible that that for guiding attention is very important. I mean, I think we would definitely agree that understanding when something new is starting is probably more important than understanding whether my T's are exactly in the right voice onset timing for this culture versus another. 
I'm not sure if there has been a lot of work in, uh, in line or in support of this model, but I find it's very uh, elegant. Exactly what, you, what you just said is, is her opinion paper that you published. Okay. Uh, okay. Exactly how language acquisition starts to go from low. Large yeah. To small. Okay. But does she go in neutral or does she think of the processes as they start from it's birth? It's actually more interesting when you look in the, we actually got the filter from names we Mm -hmm. And yes, it's a low pass filter, but it's not as low pass filter mm -hmm. as the abilities of the child. I see. So that the you alone okay. cannot explain why the child is so slow. It should be a little faster. So they, okay. they are born with a low pass, pass and a built in low pass. Yeah. So that's, that's, and we used like actual speech and pushed it through that filter that the guy. <laughs> No way. It was one of his papers. It was a sketch, and then we like copied the curve and reprogrammed oh, the filter. Sure. Lines. Data thief. Yeah. 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 So that so that worked out. Yeah. So that's that's what she is proposing. Um, I always tell my you know when you know these parents probably who who like think they want to start early with everything for the kids so they have an edge right. And I always tell us, if you please stop doing that, you might actually give them the wrong input at exactly. the wrong time. Yeah, exactly. Like mothers do or fathers do is they they're slow and they do delta, they do something like that, right? Probably there's good reason for that, exactly. But that's for the time being, this is just a hypothesis. Yeah, hypothesis. And then again, it's one of these, I mean, she also has her longitudinal data and it's kind of consistent with it. Um, but um, I think there remains so much more work to do. This could be interesting in terms of uh, development and um, developmental disorders. Right. So, I mean, similar to the prognostics. Well, if someone work out some sad studies about babies of depressed mothers, right? And it's, it's devastating. It's like they, the depressed mothers cannot produce the right input at the end because their intonation is so flat. Hmm. It's devastating. It's already in utero, uh, those, those uh, fetuses. They don't, they don't get the low frequency characteristics of their mother tongue. And then they're born to a depressed mother and still no input for their delta. Hmm. So they saying, there's no scatter for there's no scaffold for language in those babies. So they lag behind that. Interesting. No. Devastating. Yeah. That's what a critical period would be for. Right? Mm. For people who have that respect. Yeah. Okay. I think we can continue the discussions in the individual meetings and uh, over dinner. Yes. That's Thank you good. very much. Thank you. <laughs>